All right, so if you managed to get this to work either in your real device or virtual device, you should see that the project does load up as a, uh, as a functional project, but there is a difference between uh, you know, functional and usable. And so in our case, let me just load it up in my browser again, it does function, right? But the usability still needs some work. Uh, user interface and that sort of thing. So basically the look of it and the design of it. So we're going to spend some time to polish this up with CSS and so forth. So let me just run this here. Um, <coughs> while I get mine while I get mine loading up. Let me show you something here on the side. If you open a uh, if you open a, a web browser, just go to the web here and let's go to gitub.com, github.com. Raise your hand if you've heard of GitHub before. Okay. If you haven't heard of GitHub, this is basically a website where you can store your code online for free or paid, but also have other collaborators help you work with your code or share your code and so forth. Uh, and everyone uses this, even big, big, big companies. Microsoft has an account here where you can see their code for free. Their, Microsoft is getting into open source now, who would have thought? And uh, you can get a lot of Linux projects here, a lot of open source projects. Uh, but basically, it's a, let's see, what, what, how do they build themselves, how people build software. Millions of developers use GitHub to build personal projects, support their businesses, and work together on open source technologies. So basically, you create a free account you can then download the app and it synchronizes your code. Let's say I write my code on my computer at home. I save it on at home and then it synchronizes with my account on GitHub and then I can load up that code on any other computer. Uh, so I never have quite used it for classes because uh, it's not as seamless as it could be when we deal with you know classroom environments. But for personal, I really like it because I can work on my code on one computer and, it, and then I can open it in another computer. And then also because it's open source, it's available if you choose to make it open source that is public, then everyone can look at your code. The good about that is that people can help you with your code. You put your code up here, you put a link to some forum, you say, can you check out my code? It's not working. Look at line 7. And someone goes to look at it and they might tell you the answer or they might fix it for you and then upload your code. And it creates versions. This is versioning software as well. So there's version 1 of my code. Someone makes a copy of the code and works on version 2, and they work on their version, and it doesn't affect your original version. And they might fix the problem, and they say, hey, check out the code. Would you like it? And you say yes. So then their code merges with your code, and now your, your app is better. Your code is better, in theory, of course. Um, there's the business version where you pay, I guess, like $7 a month at least, private version. And then that way you can upload your code, and it's private. No one else will see it. $7 a month is not so expensive. I'm bringing this up because I've got a couple of GitHub accounts here, and I'm actually putting different versions of code up. So if you want to check this, go to github.com slash instructorvictor. And here you will see, they call them repositories, projects. I've got the project for the Android class from the fall, part one, part two, part three. Um, so for example, if you click on fall Android one, it shows you there, there's all the files of the project, a little bit of readme info, but I can go look at the index file. There's all the code. Have at it. You know, it's all there. You can click on the top right corner, and any of these repos, repositories, usually have downloading. Download the whole code. Great. I love that. I'm putting out the code out there for you, for anyone that wants it. That's a version from October, however. It's not the version of this class. Eventually, be, I'll be adding the versions of the code of this class in the last class in this semester. <coughs> the, late, the code there is six months old, and this class changes once in a while. I've been teaching it a few years, so I have to... Uh, I have to keep myself not bored, so I change it things things here and there. So the code is slightly different from semester to semester, uh, but 
you can see that there is an, a final version of Android 3 now from uh, from the previous semester final version and it's all in there WW folder there's the Kodika file and all of that stuff uh, that one that version was pouch 4 and we're on 5 whatever so all the code is here and basically what we've been doing is coming from here with some variations it's not always the same and there's still stuff we're gonna do like eventually we're going to do about social sharing being able to share the share share send via Twitter we can share our class information or whatever to Twitter from our app we're gonna get to that eventually the code is there but just by itself the code might not make a lot of sense so you know that's how we have lectures but here github.com slash instructor Victor that's where you're gonna be able to see that yes course you mentioned that um, this class evolved over the prior class in simplicity a little bit. Mm. What exactly was it that changed in this class? Uh, we rely a little bit more on jQuery. Previously it was pla it was plain old JavaScript so we had to write a little bit more code to get accomplish what we wanted to. Uh, now we're using more jQuery so we write less do more. Uh, what else has changed? Oh the big difference has been simply using taco. In the old versions, code-wise, that's not the big difference. Software-wise, the big difference is we used to use other software, which was more complex to set up. I had more, a few, like two more instruction sheets for you, and now because of Taco, it's all integrated so easily into the Taco package. I don't even have to bother with that old stuff. So that's one, and then another place that you might be interested in is GitHub.com/slash. VM Campos. That's for my non-school stuff. That's my own personal fun stuff here and there. And so I've got different kind of projects that I'm working on. Um, I've got this lucky lotto number generator kind of app. That's, that's the one there. I wanted to know how you did. <laughs> so there's a version of the code. It's not all the secrets, but it's there. <laughs> You can go in there and look at all the code. There's the index, there's the HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. It's all in there. A lot of random number stuff's going on. Um, what else? Um, pouch. This that one's kind of old. It needs to be updated. But that's when I was when I said that I had collaborated with the with the pouch people to kind of improve things. That's there. Uh, let me see drinks. What's that one? Oh, uh, this is well, the cool thing about GitHub is not only can you upload your code there, and have a copy of it, and collaborate with people, but it's like a whole kind of a, a, it's a it's a version tracking system. It's an issue tracking system. So what I mean is, I have an idea that one day I'm going to build my Mixology app. I'm going to build an app that's got you know various drinks that you can mix and videos and cool stuff. I haven't written any of the code yet, but what I'm using it for is this issue tracking system. You can see the code of an app, <coughs> issues, and right here, this is like a roadmap of what I want to do with that project. A basic feature is it's going to have an alphabetical list of drinks. Especially as, as later, it'll have an enhancement of rating the drinks. You can see that this is a way for you to develop your project where you create these milestones. So you can go over here under milestones. Uh, that one's not set up with milestones yet, but these are individual issues. I want to do this, and I want to do this, and I want to do this. And as I work on the project, I check it off. That's done. <coughs> and that's all for free. So in they the see, you have to pay if you don't want to. Yeah. Exactly. Right now, all of this is public. If anyone goes to that address, they'll be able to see all of this. And from what I put up, I'm fine with people looking at it. But if I wanted something private, I would have to pay. Yes? So it's possible then to get collaboration while I'm trying to solve this problem of syncing pouches? Definitely. Definitely. So you upload your code here, you go to various um, you know, uh, forums and such, and you say, this is my app so far, here's the link to my GitHub. Uh, repo, if anyone can help me out and check the code here. At the very least, you might get simply opinions from people. Better, people might actually go in and write the code. And there's a whole system here about branching the code. 
you know, I, I want to help someone, so I go look at their code, and then I create a branch. You know, I download the, the code, I make a branch of it, a copy it, so I don't, I don't change the original code. <laughs> I, I write the code, and then I tell the original author, hey, check out this code, maybe it works for you. And then I can approve it, and then it merges back in, and then it, uh, it, it fixes the problem. So this is a great way to collaborate with people. Look at my code, help me with it. Uh, what else? Uh, here's another one. This is this one's pretty fully functional. This is an app to um, basically do tracking of of uh, gas mileage and so forth. And this one is about 500 lines of code um, where you can do that fuel efficiency. Yes, there's plenty of other fuel efficiency apps out there. But guess what? This is my fuel efficiency app, the one that I do for fun on the side to keep up to date with this stuff and and learn something new and do it myself. Uh, so all the code basically is there and it's using pouch. See there's some JSON going on right there. This particular the, the particular document scheme for, for saving stuff in this database is I need an ID of course. So this one is is using a date. That's what keeps things um, separate. There's a, there's a date. Uh, a date that the system creates. There's also a pretty date because the system is going to save the date as, as you know, a, a computer nerd way of saving a date. I want a pretty date for, for, for the normals to, to see the date. Um, saving an odometer, saving gallons, the cost of the gallon, saving a note, and x and y coordinates for GPS, latitude, longitude. So it's still using the same system we've been talking about. It's JSON format, it's pouch, and there's all the code there you can download and play with, maybe learn something new. So if, um, if you haven't heard of GitHub before, I do recommend it. It is free, it's useful, and this is a way for you to save your code and get collaboration and help for it. And you know, uh, I have to check back my own code once in a while, and so uh, here's a quick way to me, for me to go back to get it. Any questions on this? No, not really, because I haven't I haven't fully, uh, you know, asked for it. Um, I haven't. Well, I haven't had people come to my projects and you know work on the code, but I have asked people to um, to check out my code, and I've gotten cool answers. So pretty much the only way they can get to me is if you give them the link. There is search up here. I can search up here and, and find, you know, Twitter app and see what everyone is talking about Twitter. So Yusuke right here created a Twitter app and Janoon Maker. And so Twitter bird animation. So all of these people have projects up there. Four million results. Speaking of help, uh, here's where I would recommend that you go get help. Have you heard of Google Plus? Google Plus is the place that I would recommend. Tony, question in the back. Here? Google Plus is where I would recommend to, for you to go to ask people for help because Google Plus has communities. They're like the classic message boards. Now you don't see it here until you create an account and log in, but if you've got a Gmail account, you have access to Google Plus. If you haven't heard of Heard of Google Plus? It's basically Google's version of Facebook, Google's version of Twitter. It's a social network, a very popular social network. It's my favorite social network. I use it all the time. And uh, if you do create an account, you will see that you have access to communities. And there's a community in there called JavaScript, the JavaScript community, with hundreds of thousands of people using that community, real people. And I've gone in there a few times. And I say, I'm trying to figure out this thing, you know, the code isn't quite working, it's almost there, can anyone take a look at the code? And people say, oh, here's your problem, try this jQuery instead. And I get answers. Because you can get answers for your, for your problems everywhere. But here's where I like to go, Google Plus, in the JavaScript community. Let me see if I can show this a little bit better. Search JavaScript. Yes, here it is exactly. Uh, if you 
do the search on top, type JavaScript, and then you will see communities. The JavaScript community, 145,000 members. The Node.js community, 66,000. jQuery, 79,000. HTML5, CSS, JavaScript, 17,000. So these are all real people on these various topics where once you join Google Plus and join a community, you can post and, add a, and ask a question or help, or help people. And that's been my go-to place to ask people about questions. Not the collections, the communities. For example, the web designers community, 55,000 members, 70,000 members, graphic design and web design, 31,000. So just taking a quick look at the community, there it is there, people giving away um, advice and asking questions and keeping up to date with the latest with the latest of JavaScript. All right, so let's get back to our project. Any questions on any of this? Okay, so um, what I want to do is the is work on the visuals a bit. This table doesn't look so nice. I want it to to fill the space there. Right now, it's going to grow and shrink depending on the size of the data entered. So if I added a class, and it has a big name like that, it's going to fill the screen. Now, if I have a really big name, um, it may or may not, depending on the device, it may or may not show up on screen properly. It may push the table outside of the boundary of the screen. So we need to deal with design, which is CSS. What I also want to deal with regarding CSS is this table looks really boring. I want to colorize it and make it look nicer. I want to do what is known as zebra striping. You've probably seen this before and didn't know what it was, and I'll show you an example right here. On the college's website, when you search for classes, you see a table of classes. This table here looks nice and is also functional because it has zebra striping. Can anyone guess by looking at it what I mean by that? Exactly, it alternates two shades, two different colors, one color Another color, same color, another color. It alternates, like zebra stripes. So we need to do that because that's much more readable than that. That's going to all blend together into like a jumble of rows and such. So I want to write some CSS to make my headings look nice, just like that. The top row is a heading, it stands out, I can read class, instructor, etc. And then we've got the zebra striping alternating rows of color. I want to do that with my project as well. So we've got a lot of CSS to write um, to fully get this to look nice. Functionally, it's great, but I think that's a lot of times an issue, um, perhaps with us programmers, that we're focusing more on on it working and that the code works and all of that, but we don't think too much about the user interface. And that's still valuable also. You know, I spent 300 lines of code to get that, that fuel efficiency, 500 lines of code to get that fuel efficiency app working. And that was just part one. Now I'm working on visually making it look nice. So, um, 
that's what we need to talk about here. Now, just because I do want to want to show an example of that, I don't want to quite record this, but uh, that fuel efficiency act app that I'm talking about, it, there is a version of it online that you can play with. I'm not going to record this because it's beta testing. It's alpha <laughs> testing. If you go to this address, you can play with that fuel efficiency app that I'm talking about. The code is on GitHub, um, most of it, and then the um, functionality of it is here. So it's a little better if you actually load it on a real device because it's going toward being a real app. But if you load it up on your browser and you view it with, you know, responsive view, allow location, yes. Actually, yeah, well, anyway, if it's not quite working, that's where that's at. But what I'm getting at is again about we've got the coding working well, we need to also talk about the design of it and the CSS. So that's what we'll, that's what we'll work with now. Okay, so that's going to be some CSS. Let's back up a little bit to our code. Let's go back to Notepad. Let's go back to the JavaScript. And we need to find line... ...125 or so. Line 125 or so is our show table of classes function. This is the function that takes the data from pouch and displays it on screen <coughs> in a table, line 125. And we added a um, we added an ID right there, class table. We added an ID so that we can reference it via the code, but also via CSS, because IDs and classes also make sense in CSS. So I'm going to write some CSS to help us style this table, because the default styling, obviously, is not very good. Default styling is very plain. So from our project folder. Let's open the Codica external.css file. So let's open codica.extra.external.css. Let's open the CSS file in Notepad. We'll scroll to the end of the project. I'm going to write some CSS here. There's an ID, so pound sign, class, table. Is that what we call it? Uh, class table, yes. ID, class, table. So that means in the CSS, pound, class, table. Curly brace, couple of enters, close curly brace. At the moment, the table will only uh, display as much content as is in the, the table. See, if I just take it back like that as an example, this table doesn't go far enough. I wanted to fill up the whole width that it has here. So we will write a width value. Let's start off with with 100%. So 
that table on screen should then stretch out to be 100% of the container that it's in. I'm not going to do it every time, but just for the moment I will run it in the browser because it's going to take a while to keep loading and seeing this stuff. At this point we're not going to see the table unless we're actually running it via taco. We're not going to be able to see the result with run Firefox because the whole on-device ready, right? I just want to quickly run it in my browser at the very least to see if that works and then we'll go on. Um, it takes too long because I've got too much stuff running, so that's okay. With 100%, and we're also going to say margin auto, that'll also help center the table on screen if necessary. So it'll stretch it out and also center it. Margin auto, that was a trick we used a while ago when I said, remember, on a sheet of paper, we can easily put half inch, half inch, and it's centered. When we're sideways, we need to do two inches, two inches, and we're centered. Margin auto will put an automatic amount of margin around it, therefore basically centering it on screen. There we go. So without that margin, without the margin and without the, the width, and then with it, stretch that out over there, 100%. What I want to do is some devices don't adhere to word wrap, and some do. So with a little CSS here, we will make sure that whatever words are too long get cut off and they force a word wrap. Uh, so we will do table-layout fixed. We'll add text-wrap. So we do have a text wrap um, attribute that we can set. We'll say normal. And then we'll need one more, which is word wrap. Break dash word. So through some trial and error and such, in previous semesters, we figured out that the best way to make sure that this table doesn't go off the edges is with these with these things here: table layout, text wrap, and word wrap. And then that breaks your content into, into new lines. Um, then I want to add uh, some of that color. I want to add some design elements to the table. So the very first row in our table, if we go back just to remind ourselves how it works back to the JS file, it creates a table and then we've got a row and a TH. So the very first row of our table are THs, table headings. We can style that. We can style that. So we'll do something here we, we haven't done very much in our code so far. We've usually been specifying you know, a tag, or a, uh, a class, or an ID. But here, we need to specify two tags. We need to specify a TH, so 
Let's do it like this first. So let's say we're going to style th, <coughs> table headings. That would be too general. Any table in my project would then adhere to the following rules. Because I can use th multiple times on various screens, and maybe I want a certain table to have a certain color layout, and another table to have a different color layout. So actually, we want to be more specific. We want to say pound class table space th. Now we're saying only the table headings in this particular table. And because we've used an ID, we're specifying <coughs> one table throughout our whole project. Only one thing can be named with an ID in a <coughs> project, remember. So now we're saying any th that is used in this table style it the following way. And we can figure out better colors later, but for the moment we'll say background dash color. I'll just use purple to be obvious. And then color or text color. Because right now this would be black text on a purple background. That'd be hard to read. So what I want to do is just for contrast white. So here I'm, uh, I'm taking the very first row of, of, um, of the table and styling it a little bit. And then to achieve the zebra striping, we can use a little bit of CSS3. So the latest version of CSS to alternate between rows, because there's always an even row and there's always an odd row. So we'll see that... There we go. So I've got a, a color there. Obviously it clashes with my main color scheme, but we can edit that later. And I'm going to add a little bit more data here. And now the problem is, okay, these are going to start to run into each other visually. I want one particular row a certain style and another one another color. We've got odd rows, we've got even rows. Odd, even, odd, even. So we can use a little bit of CSS3 to help us do that very easily. In the old days this was hard. We would have to add classes to each one of these rows and then write our code. And that's okay if I've got three rows, but this is dynamic. I have to write a class every single time. So we're going to create another rule down here. And we already know that we're going to be talking about dealing with this particular table. So we'll say pound class table. And it might not be too obvious, but there is a space right here. If yours didn't work, there's a space right there. If there was no space, it would look like that. Table lift. There's a space there. So I need the same sort of thing here. I'm building this table. Space TR. Now I'm going to affect the look of a particular row. Space curly braces. I'm dealing now with rows in this table. But to specify odd rows, even rows, I have to add this extra thing. Um, this pseudo selector, as they call it. I'm going to go back to tr. There's no space here. It's tr colon nth dash of dash type. nth of type. Because, you know, there's the first, there's the second, there's the third, there's the 90th, there's the 40th. So which one? nth of type. Open, close, parentheses, odd. I'm dealing with the odd rows. TR means row, table row. I'm dealing with the odd ones. The first, the, the third, the fourth, the, the fifth, the seventh, the ninth, the eleventh. So the odd ones. 
And here it's just going to be, again, simply background color and so forth. Background color, um, I just have some color here, 059. Now you don't have to write this, but background dash color uh, these two lines are synonymous you can do a little shortcut when your hexadecimal numbers are repeated like this you can just short, shorten it down to non-repeating so color 005599 is the same as color 059 that only works if you're repeating numbers. So if I had you know, FF2277, that would be the same as F27. So I do want to see my result at this point. I'm going to run it in my browser. Here's my code so far. Styling the table in general. Styling the heading specifically. And now styling odd numbered rows. What colors actually, you know, we need, you need to decide uh, based on the other colors of your, of your project. Let's see how that works. Oh, it's a terrible color. But we're seeing alternating colors. That's not so bad. I guess we can put white on the text. Uh, but OK, it's the odd ones. So the very first one, one, is odd. The second one, then, is even. The third one is odd. The next one is even. If I add another one, it automatically fills in odd, even, odd, even. So what if I did want to set the, the even colors? We have the knowledge to do it. So here it's alternating odds, odds and evens. You, you said even or odd? We said odd. But we didn't have we? No, but it is counting it as the very first row, which is odd, okay. has been set by the heading. Mm -hmm. So it skips it. Okay. Then the next one is even, and the next okay. one is odd. Okay. So here's my code so far. If you manage to make it work, is the code so far. Did that work for everyone? When I choose a better color, where you might want to do it, add a color for that text, and we'll do an even results. Right. Are you running it by a top
All right, so here we're seeing that we can style that table. And in my case, I, I think that background color looks nice, perhaps. But then the foreground color doesn't work because it's black on blue. Very hard to read. So I'll just add a text color there. I won't check it because it'll probably work if I type it properly. Uh, so that's color, and I guess just white. White's good contrast. So moving on, what I want to do also is um, here we've got delete class update class and uh, what I would like to see if what I can do is I want to put just like I've got here I like how this is that you've got this box here and then the button that goes with it and these are kinda you know moving down to their own line here I want to style that via CSS so um, back on the JavaScript file, remember I had asked, let's write this because eventually we're going to style it. Back on line 137, we have a class here called div to call. We were setting ourselves up to make two columns. So the way this works, let me draw it here to help visualize it. We've got Um, a div that's the whole container and that's div to call and then we're going to have um, a left column and a right column that's what we set up in the code it doesn't show up like that on screen yet however because there's no CSS to actually define that and what we get right now is that it's all kind of stacked upon itself like that. So I want to have a column on the left for the update button and a column on the right for the boxes. That's what our JavaScript is showing here, that, that we wrote div, div to call and then uh, I think we did div um, right call, right call, and left call, div left call. Left call. 
div left call. So we've got the structure, we've got the divs, so then now we just need to write the, uh, the CSS to actually line it all up and space it and so forth. There's our to call, and then le div left call, and div right call. So we'll go back to the CSS file. After class table. Oh, before I forget, um, it does matter in this case about this space here for tr nth of type. If we added a space after the colon, it won't work. Or if we add a space before the colon, it might not work. So there's no space between tr and nth of type. But here now we're going to uh, edit this div, and it's a class. So dot div to call. This is a class, meaning that we can reuse it throughout um, throughout our project. Just like we've got image resized up on top and so forth. So anywhere we want to do a two column sort of layout like this, we can reuse this class. I'm going to say with 95%. I don't want it to stretch out as far as the table above, just for a little visual interest, a little breathing room. We're going to make it 95% of the width. Uh, to center it on screen, we'll do the margin auto trick again. So that's building the whole outside container of the two left and right columns. So next line, dot uh, div left call. Dot div right call. And so what I'm doing here is adding a width. And I'm going to use about 20% um, because I've got the whole container, div to call. That's going to stretch out. But then I only want about 20% of the inside of that container reserved for the left column. I also want to add float left. And this is just to keep things lined up, uh, to keep them in line. The default behavior is remember we've talked briefly about uh, block level and inline level elements. A block level element is going to want to take up all of the space on that line and push the rest <coughs> down to their own line. An inline element is going to play nice and stay on one line uh, with everything else. And so here we're saying float left and basically we're going to say keep this to the left and the next things that we're going to add also will be to the left. They'll all be on the same line, basically. So let's go over to div right call. Um, this is just to, to look ahead, but uh, we'll do 70% here. Yes, it does not add up to 100, but that's because of the next ones. Uh, padding dash left. 20 pixels and margin dash bottom 10 pixels. This is going to be a little bit of design here to line things up nicely and float left. No, it would make sense to put right, but we still want to keep it left because it's just that everything needs to be on the same line, and this is just basically the way to do it.
All right, this, um, this is one of the things that, um, depending on our, on our layout and such, uh, we may have to finesse it a little bit. Let, let's see what mine looks like so far. So my classes, show classes, yeah, that's looking good. There it is. So we've got the, the left column and the right column. The whole thing is a div. Left column, right column, 20%, 30%, a little bit of padding and such. And there it is in the design. So if I want to update class RRR, I can tap it. <coughs> update it. Gets updated. Uh, ten percent um, yeah, to make up for it. Yeah. Um, still twenty pixels. Yes, uh, we'd have to test how it behaves, but we would be able to uh, use those values instead. Instead of pixels, we could try percent. Because we've got seventy, eighty, ninety, and then ten percent in theory. Probably. Yeah, you can try it and then see how it works. Yes? So my small phone, the 20% is it white for the update button. Hmm. So uh, just your platform coding that so that it functions on multiple devices. So. Yeah, that's the issue about uh, it's always a good idea to actually, to actually test it um, on as many devices as possible. I would have um, maybe played with those percentages a little bit because it looks like we may be uh, robbing some of the space from it. Uh, so that is that is an issue to some degree nowadays about what are what are my exact values, and I'm dealing with so many kinds of devices that it is yeah, problematic. And yeah, and that's why uh, that's why the um, the Percentages are often the most valuable, but still, testing it gives you the full experience. So I've been running it on my real device. I also want to see, I mean on my virtual, I also want to see what does it look like on my real device. So I'll take a quick moment to do that. Taco run uh, Android. And while that's loading up, so so design-wise, that's what I'm getting. Um, let's say I wanted, like, I, at, at the moment, um, the at the moment the. See just a moment. At the moment, the functionality is that if uh, I click on any of the rows, actually anywhere in the row, it'll populate the field down there. That might not be obvious for people. We know it works because we programmed it. And that's often the kind of tunnel vision that we get as we're doing something. We know how it works because we thought of it and we programmed it. But we have to think about how other people might uh, behave with it. So another aspect of beta testing is to have someone else, hey, check this out, and try to do this task. And then they'll say, oh, why, why is there no edit button? I have to type it manually? <laughs> so let's take a moment to add, um, to make it obvious, to add <coughs> buttons to be able to let people know. Click this pencil to edit this field. That'll require that we add a pencil to uh, to each of the rows here 
at the beginning or at the end. You do it multiple ways if you think about it. So let's say we want to add a pencil to the end, to the end of the row. I'm going to click the pencil, and it's going to populate the field down here to edit. And so, <coughs> if we go back to our code, JavaScript, we're going to need to do it here. Because in the JavaScript um, is where we're building that table. We've got it happening right here, piece by piece, on line 127. It iterates through the for loop, build the first row, then go to the next row, build the next row, loop again, build the next one. So I'm adding here a row, and then an, a TD, a cell, and then something in each of the cells. Now, again, via styling and so forth to figure out how it should fully look, that'll require some more effort. But just for the moment to, um, to make it be obvious, uh, we're going to build... Let's see what's the best way. We're going to build... Um, we're going to set it up so that there's going to be a new column, so that it's always on the right side. There's going to be a brand new column with the edit pencil, the little pencil icon. Uh, so we're going to need to build a, a brand new a brand new column. Uh, that means we're going to back up to line 126. back up to line 126. That's where we're building our THs. We've got a, a heading, a column for CRM, class, instructor. Let's add a new TH. TH. It's going to be a new column there. And I need an empty space. Um, the cell might collapse, it may behave weird, so we can force an empty space here with NBSP. That's a non-breaking space. It's going to have one little empty space there. It's a brand new heading, THTH, non-breaking space. So now we can add a, a new TD because there's a new column. One, two, three, four, fourth column. We can add a new TD here. Uh, so after our line of 130, we need to create something similar as the previous lines. <coughs> Basically quotes plus space quote. Right, the same sort of syntax something quoted plus something dynamic slash td open td again because this td this closed td closes the previous cell the instructor column we open a brand new td and close it there and then we can add something in the middle there For the moment, uh, let's make it say, in quotes here, simply edit. We'll jazz that up with an actual button and so forth in a moment. But here, the word edit will appear. <coughs> the word edit will be added at the end of every row. Uh, at this point, I, I'll take a quick look at it in my browser. And so what that will do, hopefully, is uh, build a brand new column. In a moment, we'll see that. A new column, and it'll say the word edit. We'll make it actually look like a button and behave like a button in a moment. 
uh, but I want to make sure that's running as I expected so far. You see what we are seeing is that um, in my case, it's a little weird <laughs> in that this is uh, cutting off that word and giving it too much space. So again, this is about this design that that we need to worry about, which which we will. But technically, what's happening? Okay, people will see a button for edit. The, we'll see the pencil eventually. The concept is someone will click the pencil. It'll populate into that field where then they can actually edit it. So the functionality is still the same about anywhere in that row that you click on. So I can still click on this first row over here. Anywhere that you click on will populate the fields to be able to edit it. But now we actually have a target where people have something to look at, something to think about clicking. You notice by adding it into the for loop, it's giving edit every single line. Now on this one, to actually make it look like buttons, here we, we have to jump through a few hoops. Um, I have to double check my note here. We Here if we wanted to make this behave like a, like a jQuery mobile button, we can, we can set this up via jQuery and then data role <coughs> equals icon and all of that. Uh, I forgot to, to prep that code, unfortunately. So let's take a short break. I'm going to pull that code up, and then uh, we'll make this part work where it's got the edit button uh, working properly. So oops, we're already at an hour anyway. So I'm going to save this so far. We'll take a 10-minute break. It's 8.32. We'll be back at 8.42. I'll put a copy of my code at the moment to the network folder, and then we'll make that button look like a real button. <laughs>